Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Bucks County Homes and Living Show. My name is Paul Rosso, and we have a great show lined up for you today with my guest, Holly Soffer. Holly's going to be and I are going to be talking about the agreement of sale in the state of Pennsylvania, the standard agreement of sale. Welcome, Holly. Thanks, it's Paul. Nice. Thank, Thank you, you for, for coming having in. me. It's really nice to be here. Okay, terrific. So, Holly, um, well, actually, before I start that, let me do the uh, call in line here. If you have a question for Holly or myself, you can reach us at 856 359 4232. So, Holly, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? What do you do? Yes, I am an attorney. I have been practicing for, and this will date me, 27 <laughs> years now um, in Bucks County. Not all in Bucks County. Started out in Philadelphia. Okay. Been in Bucks County since 1993. Excellent. Um, I'm in a small firm, and I do lots of different things, um, business stuff, um, legislative work, uh, wills. Um, trust, things like that, and also, obviously, real estate yeah, law, which definitely. is the reason that I'm here today to talk to you. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your firm and, you know, are there any other um, uh, partners in the firm and, uh, you know, well, what else do you do? we're in transition now, so okay. right now it's just me, but I work inside another law firm, so I have lots of resources of other attorneys um, okay. if there's something that comes up in other areas. Um, it was a family business. People have left and retired, and I do still have one attorney who works for me as a, a of counsel, which okay. is a way of saying an employee sort of in a, um, in a law firm. Okay, excellent. So we're going to talk about the agreement of sale today, the standard agreement of sale in the state of Pennsylvania. Not the most exciting thing, but a very but important we'll make part. it exciting. That's it. We'll do our best. So, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, I guess a little bit about the history. I know myself, I've been uh, selling real estate for uh, 20 some years. I'll let it go at that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I first started out, there was one page agreement of sale and uh, an addendum. So it was, I consider that like a page and a half. Okay. Yeah, it and started, now we have a lot more. <laughs> we do. I, the new agreement that just came out in April is 13 pages long. Right. And also when I started practice, it was much shorter. And then in about 2005, it went to sort of an eight page document, um, 10 page document, and now it's 13 pages and they really have put a lot in there, all to benefit the buyer. A okay. lot of explanation, a lot more things that, um, when I was a, a lawyer um, years ago, we would look at the agreement, and if you represented the seller, it was pretty much good as is. Right. But representing a buyer, there was a lot that I would add in, things that I would cross out, mm -hmm. different language that I would want in there. And over the years, really, there's a lot of that has been incorporated into the standard agreement. So right. now there's um, a lot more to explain to somebody, but a lot less to actually add in. Right. And, and uh, you know, these agreements are reviewed by attorneys through the Pennsylvania Association of Realtors, and they try to make it as even as possible. And, uh, you know, sometimes, um, you know, an attorney will look at this and want to change a few things. Uh, the problem generally gets into if... if uh, Attorneys representing the buyer wants to change some things, then you got an attorney representing the seller, and they want to bring things back. So it gets, in, gets a little hairy sometimes. And, you know, sometimes, uh, even as we discuss this, there may be some disagreement between the two of us, and that's okay. I mean, it's part of, uh, you know, the uh, real estate transaction. That's it's true. And there used to be, um, well, some states, actually, it was never in Pennsylvania, some states put into their agreement an attorney review clause, and right. it says, you have X number of days um, to show this to your attorney, and it's not valid for that number of days. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania does not have that. Right. Um, what, the only thing that Pennsylvania has that's even close to that is if you're refinancing and someone's coming to your home, you have a three-day right of rescission, which means you can change your mind within those three days and say you don't want to go through with it any longer. But that's not in the standard agreement of sale. And just right. to make clear, we're talking about um, – an agreement that's a standard for resale property yes. because new home builders all have their own agreements each one is different than the other and those are often very different than these and give the buyers a lot less rights and explanation that is in this agreement definitely and so how is uh, if we have time today how are we going to talk about the uh, new construction agreements to sale in general uh, you know if not hopefully we can have how come back and talk to us a little bit more about that and and uh some of the other clauses too. So we're going to focus today on the main agreement of sale, maybe touch on some of the addendums that come along with that could be possible as part of the agreement of sale. And if we don't get them today, maybe we can get to them another time. So on the first page of the agreement of sale, 
Um, you're going to have... I need my glasses to see this. That's okay. <laughs> that's, that's a function of how long I've been practicing law. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. And so in the first agreement of sale, you know, in the agreement of sale, first page, excuse me, we're going to generally have the uh, buyers and sellers' names there, also the real estate uh, companies. And generally, uh, in most situations, there's two different companies involved. And then there's also uh, the agents involved in their information. And then on the bottom of the first page, it gets into uh, dual, what dual agency is and designated agency. So, um, you know, I'll talk, let me talk about a little bit, and then you okay. can share your thoughts too. Because dual agency is a difficult situation. It is. So in a dual agency is a situation where I would be representing the seller because I have the seller's house on the market with a listing contract. And then a buyer comes to me and wants to purchase the house, and they want representation also. And that's a tricky thing because now we're representing both parties, and we have an obligation to be fair to both parties also. And some, you know, even though it's not the best scenario, and attorneys don't like that, and I think Holly will mention that too. We don't. Um, right. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's the nature of the business that sometimes we'll represent both parties. Well, that can sometimes be cured by if each side has an attorney as well as a realtor. Yes. And, and that really helps, and I think that situa situation works a lot better that way because then you're not telling your, who you think is your realtor, okay, I'll spend this much, and the negotiation becomes difficult because really after that it works with the dual agency. Right. And so, you know, the sellers want you to sell their house naturally, and, right. you know, Sometimes I, I toy with the idea of just representing one party, but you know if you um, if you have a contract with the seller, they want you to sell the house. And I explain to them that it's going to be difficult somewhere along the way in a dual agency. One of the party or the other is going to be upset at us, especially over repairs. But once we get through that, it's generally okay. Um, it's something we have to disclose to both parties if we act in dual agency. Now, another form of what used to be dual agency, but they have a new designation now called a designated agency. agency. And that's where one agent in an office is, is, uh, has the listing contract, and one agent in my office would have the buyer and their contract. In which case, the uh, broker then declares as both kind of independent. They call it designated. One's designated for the seller. One's designated for the buyer. In, and when the law firms used will be, to do that, they used to call it putting up a Chinese wall. Don't okay. ask me where that expression came from. <laughs> okay. That's what they used to call it. Right. And so uh, <laughs> my broker, the broker who's in charge of both agents will be acting in a dual agency, but the agents themselves will be acting differently. Now, it's, it's not often that an, um, a dual agency or a designated agency comes about, so we don't have as many situations, but I try to sit down and explain the circumstances at the listing contract and also in a buyer contract. Um, and then I always go over it again if that's the case when I present an agreement of sale, when I write agreement of sale, okay? And so can you tell us a little bit about maybe some of the difficulties involved in a well, dual agency? The difficulties are the obvious ones that would come to mind and that is the confidentiality and right. the loyalty factor. When you have one person representing you, you feel that you can tell that person everything, all of your guidelines, and that that person will be just loyal to you and fighting for you and trying to either buy or sell. Sometimes that's not necessary. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. it's a very amicable transaction where it might be family members, it might be friends, or it just might be people that have agreed on the price and the house is in good shape, so there really are no issues that arise. Mm -hmm. And obviously it would work better in that kind of situation. And again, not, not to plug myself or other lawyers, but a dual agency or even a designated agency can work well if they both have lawyers sure. because you can say, okay, the realtor's really the realtor's job is to bring you the buyer. The attorney's job is really to go over the documents and, and help you negotiate. And that way, the realtors can do most of the negotiation. But if you're the buyer, for instance, and you have something you feel is confidential, or if you're the seller, that you don't want the other side or the other side's realtor, who's the same person as your realtor to know that way you can say I'm keeping this confidential I'm only telling my attorney and you advise me as to how to present it to the realtor or to the other side um, mm -hmm. I, I've seen the designated agency work really well yeah because even though realtors all work together in the same office you really maintain separate practices and yes. and <coughs> realtors have a professional duty obviously to keep certain things confidential and right. I, I've seen that work pretty well Again, if there's something 
particular to your transaction and you think it's not going to work, then get a lawyer. Otherwise, I've seen that work. Okay. And it's all obviously it has to be disclosed to both sides. Right. And again, on a run of the mill simple transaction, it will probably work well. If you have a doubt, just ask about it if you're getting into something like that or get a lawyer in that way. For a little bit more money, you have someone who's just on your side who can advise you and maybe communicate what you want to the realtor who can then mm -hmm. communicate it to the other side and then it can all work out pretty well. Right. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, I have to advise someone to get an attorney. Um, you know, it's generally not needed, but sometimes, some situations it is needed. Right. And, and the way to see is one of the tricky for things. for part of the transaction, right. not necessarily the whole thing. Sure. Definitely. Okay, then we go into page two, and we have, there you, you put down the date of the agreement of sale, and then the purchase price that uh, you want to offer to the seller. Generally, you're going to uh, provide good faith uh, money, and it's going to be in the form of a check. Uh, generally, you know, it's a thousand dollars or more. The check is generally not deposited until both parties come to the agreement, come to a full agreement. Although some real estate offices do deposit the check. Generally, then within like you're going to put down uh, an additional deposit. If you don't put down a large sum as the initial deposit, you're going to put down an additional deposit. Deposit maybe in seven, ten, or fifteen days, um, and then um, any deposit money is given prior to 30 days of settlement, generally have to be in the form of a cashier's check or um, wired funds there, okay? Um, then we get into a seller assist. Sometimes the uh, buyer wants the seller to pay some closing costs, and if that's the case, you're going to specify how much closing costs you want the oh, Always uh, on HGTV, to do. but not as much in reality. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, and then you're going to declare the settlement date and what, you know, what the settlement date is. Um, in that clause with the settlement and possession, we'll also talk about um, uh, paying transfer tax. Generally, this transfer tax is divided evenly between the uh, buyer and the seller. And um, outside in the counties, it's 1% each side. Inside Philadelphia, it's 2% <laughs> each side. And then, um, you know, you're going to uh, convey title to the, pro to the property so and how that's going to be conveyed. One thing that's new in here, um, that's new in this most current form of okay. the agreement is um, this agreement in general just gives more information to people than the old agreement. It defines mm -hmm. terms and gives background of all the different terms that are used, which is very right. unusual to see in a contract mm -hmm. and pretty much unique to Pennsylvania. And one of the things they now do is um, at closing, of course, your taxes are prorated, yes. meaning the real estate taxes you only pay from the time you move into the house until the end of whatever that tax year may be. And, and in the suburbs, there are two different tax right. periods, and they're specified in here by county, which um, is something that's really new. So it's one one less thing that I have to go over with people because it's all spelled out in the agreement. Right. So that's you know an example of things that are in here that are not really part of the contract, but more just by way of explanation. Right. And prior to this contract, a lot of the explanations were put at the end, right. and nobody will review nobody them. Nobody read them because they were on cards <coughs> on the back on pink and light green paper, and it right. was really hard to read, so nobody ever looked at it. Yes. And then when they started printing out the uh, the electronic forms, and they, they uh, threw them in the back, uh, the last eight pages. Now, basically, they took those eight pages of explanations and brought the information into the contract, right. made the contract a little bit longer, but like, as you said, it explains a lot of things more about some of the terms involved here, okay? Then you're going to put dates and times of the contract, okay? When, uh, when you want to make settlement, oh, I'm sorry, first we're going to talk about when the seller is going to accept it, and generally it's a one or two day time frame for the seller to accept, unless it's, you have a situation where there may be an estate sale. Um, or, or a power of attorney, they may need a little bit more time. Um, and as far as the, uh, uh, once, once everybody agrees to it, we have what's called an, ex an execution date. And then you're going to have, as we'll discuss in a few minutes, uh, inspections. And everything else in time frame wise starts the day after, day one starts the day after the fully executed agreement of sale. And that's something they've put in there as well. They sort of adopted that from other um, legal documents and put the same rules in there. Okay. And there are a lot of time frames, and I don't know if you do this, but one thing that I advise my clients to do is to buy a little cheap calendar, separate calendar just mm -hmm. for this, and 
take, uh, you know, five days from this date, you have ten days from this date, four days right. from this date, and just mark the dates in the little calendar. I That's guess people do it electronically now <laughs> well, we on their don't. iPhones or yeah. other phones, but back in the day, and I, I still tell people, put it down, and that way you get a reminder or on your phone or you can look in your calendar and see the different deadlines because right. fishing through this document and counting back days is really difficult and you yes. don't want to miss a deadline. Yeah, and I definitely, you know, it's one of the things I do is I review and remind people when, yeah. when deadlines or are. Or use Paul as your realtor and he'll do all that work for <laughs> oh, you. Thank you there, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all be right. buying him a caseload of calendars for yes. his next birthday. Uh, yep. <laughs> and then we have zoning. Um, you know, you're required to uh, put the zoning down there, especially if it's a non-residential uh, uh, property. And that's new also that it has to be filled out. The, the last line is, is fairly recent that if it's not residential and that's not filled out, it voids the whole agreement, which means the whole agreement doesn't exist anymore. It's terminated. Right. And this way, you know, it's a situation where someone says a house is zoned residential, but it's actually zoned commercial. Or do you think a house is... Uh, commercial because of a business that may be operating there, but it's actually zoned residential with a variance. You know, as a buyer, you need to know that. And like how we said, that if if it if it's not spelled out and it's not correct, the buyer has the right to get out of the contract there. Uh, next item is the fixtures and personal property. Boy, did they go to town putting yes. things in there. There used to be just a few things listed in there, and it was making me laugh um, when I read the newest one because it has in there um, things like hot tub covers right. and um, things for, that relate to electronic equipment. Um, all of that is obviously new because those things didn't even exist <laughs> when this yes. agreement was first written. Right, and you know, this is one of those things that's tricky in the contract as to what's being left and what's not. There is, um, so there are a lot of uh, uh, items put in there to the contract, and then you can also add in uh, additional items that are being included. Uh, if there's anything that's leased, uh, that's supposed to be spelled out, and then anything the seller is going to take with them should be down in the excluded part also. Okay, the next item is a major part, and that is the uh, mortgage contingency. You know, you're going to waive it if you're paying cash for the house, and you're going to elect it if you're getting a mortgage for the property. Generally, in, the, in that situation, you're putting in the uh, loan amount, the terms of the contract, the type of mortgage you're getting. It's very specific. Right. And they even define loan to value ratio and terms. Yes. And loan to value was put in recently only because of, uh, for, you know, as the market was uh, coming down, a lot of homes didn't appraise, and you want to make sure that the buyer uh, it has a way to get, to get out of the contract if the house doesn't appraise and the loan to value puts them in from a 20% loan to less than 20% because then the buyer is responsible for paying what's called private mortgage insurance. And I don't know how much time we have, but I have a quick story. Um, if you have a good realtor like Paul, this won't be a problem for you. <laughs> but I had clients that um, came in and showed me the agreement and they had a problem because the whole thing was filled out, but the mortgage contingency paragraph, nothing was checked. There, you can't see this if you're watching, but there are two boxes. One says waived and the other says elected. And in this particular case, neither one was checked. So, mm -hmm. and the person didn't end up getting a mortgage. And he said, well, I told them at the time that I needed to get the mortgage or I wouldn't be able to buy the property. Right. And the seller said, you never told us that and you didn't check it either way. And it ended up in litigation for years. And the, the, the amount of money that was given as a deposit was $40,000. Mm. So the buyer didn't want to lose the $40,000 but right at that time, the market went down, as Paul was saying before, mm -hmm. and the seller, if he had to resell the property, would have gotten a lot less for it. So he wanted to keep the $40,000 and, of course, had to keep paying the taxes on the property sure. during the time this was litigated. It took years to resolve, and the eventual resolution after going to court was that they split it, which, of course, <laughs> was the suggestion in the beginning, but right. there, was a lot, there were a lot of complexities involved. So it's really important to take the time to fill everything out and don't leave anything blank. And if you have a question, yeah. ask. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, with all the check boxes here, it's, it's you got to really double and triple check these contracts because it's easy to miss a box uh, every now and then. It was a lot easier when you were just handwriting it or, you know, just doing it by right. hand with your pen. But now that everything's done pretty much electronically, and if you mix a box, if you miss a box, it can cause a lot of issues. You end up years issue. of litigation. Um, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And then you're going to put a mortgage commitment date in there, too. And that's a date where the lender, you know, we're trying to shoot for the lender 
to have the mortgage application uh, finalized and the commitment to lend the money also. Um, you know, it's a, it's a date that everyone tries to keep sometimes, uh, especially in today's mortgage world, is, you know, it, it doesn't work out that the date is, is kept. Um, if the date's not kept, the seller naturally has the right to pull out of the contract if, uh, if they choose to do so. So we try our best to get the lenders to uh, meet that deadline if at all possible. You could do a whole other show on how mortgages have changed, mortgage applications oh, no. have changed over the years. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, uh, boy, that, we didn't get too far here. No. But uh, just want to touch on a little bit more about the mortgage clause. Um, one of the concerns is, you know, with a house appraised, and there is a uh, appraisal contingency that you have a certain amount of time frame to uh, have the appraisal done. And if the house doesn't appraise, the buyer can choose to get out of the contract. What, maybe you should just explain for people what that means. When you say it doesn't appraise, it means it's the value set by an appraiser isn't what the purchase price is. Good point there, definitely. And uh, if you're buying FHA, there's a clause in the mortgage con contingency clause that talks about, um, you know, that the house has to appraise. And in the FHA clause, or actually FHA or VA clause, gives an, that the house has to appraise for the sale price. Um, and in that clause also is there's a notice from uh, HUD uh, that talks about, uh, you know, recommending get a home inspection. I wouldn't recommend anybody um, no, not get that's a home inspection. Very great, that is great advice, obviously. Yeah. Even if you're buying it as is, even if the seller says, Take it or leave it, it's as is. Still get the inspection yes. because you know what you're getting into. Yeah, definitely. You know, sometimes when when it, you have a hot property or and it's going to be multiple bids, people want to, you know, use one of their options is not requiring a home inspection. But, boy, if, you're, if you don't know enough about construction, um, it's very dangerous to do that. I, I'd rec I always recommend losing a house versus... Trying to trying to pull that out is one of the negotiating it's tools. Probably other than college tuition, it's probably <laughs> the biggest investment you'll make in That's, your entire life. Yeah, definitely <laughs> there. And in the FHA clause, also you're going to certify that all the terms of the uh, contract are true and accurate there, here. And so, how we uh, we're uh, kind of <laughs> short on time here, so uh, perhaps we can schedule another time to sure, uh, do I'd part two back. of this agreement of sale here. Um, how you? I want to talk to you a little bit about. Uh, you know, Bucks County, since we have a Bucks County show here, um, you know. Uh, I'd love to. I'm, I've been a lifelong resident of Bucks County, okay. except for when I went to college and law school. But okay. other than that, I've lived in Bucks County my okay. whole life. Right. And do you have, uh, acti you know, any favorite restaurants or favorite things to do in Bucks sure. County? Well, one thing I've taken up recently uh, is biking. And um, people I bike with will, will laugh because <laughs> I'm a beginner. But um, I bought a, a bike and have been riding along the canals. And that's one thing that's really great in Bucks County if you're interested in outdoor activities. The canal path runs all the way from um, Bristol all the way, and it connects at various points. You can go all the way up to the Lehigh Gorge, which is uh, pretty far. So I've been right. doing the parts near Yardley, Washington Crossing, and then you can cross over to the Jersey side and go up to um, Stockton. And then so far, Frenchtown, New Jersey, is the farthest north that I've that I've gotten. Yeah, yeah, and they have. I love that place. It's really fun because you can ride along the canal. It's flat, which is really great. <laughs> and then you can stop in little towns and eat lunch and walk around. And you right. see lots of other people on bikes. They have places to leave your bike. So that's something that's really unique to Bucks County. Um, I actually met someone while riding on a trail from Norristown to Maniunk um, that said that he takes the train to Yardley just to, to ride the canals and has to, you know, travel with the bike on the train. <laughs> just So we're lucky that we live here and yeah, it's definitely. so close. And of course, all the little restaurants in there, you can stop when you're going from Yardley to um, North, you can stop in um, New Hope and Lambertville. Mm -hmm. And again, there are little restaurants, there are fun towns to walk around there. Um, and you can leave your bike or you can just walk along the canal path or just, you know, there's ki a friends of mine recently bought kayaks and you can go kayaking in Core Creek Park. So if you're interested in outdoor activities, it's great. Yeah. Um, in the winter, I guess, um, we, we're stuck with eating out and going to <laughs> movies and the other th and the normal things that right. everybody does in the winter. Yeah. Um, but it's still so beautiful up there, though. It right. is, just yeah, to take definitely. a ride. Oh my God. And there's yeah. Upper Black Eddy with Upper the parks up there. If you, I also hike, um, and there are lots of beautiful hikes in the area. And if you step outside Bucks County, go a little bit farther north into the Poconos, Jim Thorpe area, there's great hiking up there. Mm -hmm. I'm really, really great. Yeah. You guys, Glen Oco Falls. You, you know what? You guys forgot to mention the, uh, the whitewater rafting. 
I may be doing that soon up in the mountains. <laughs> yeah. There's tubing along the Delaware, tubing but that's the not Delaware. really right. white water tubing. That's not right, right. 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 And then up in the mountains, um, there's white water rafting up yeah, in the Yeah, we've done that a couple of times. Area. Yes. Definitely. That's a blast. And yeah, uh, yeah tubing is a, a big thing in, along the Delaware there. Uh, my wife and I are going to be doing that in July. Well, good luck. Uh, around and her also birthday. The schools, if you're thinking of moving to Bucks County, both of my children um, went all through the Pensbury School District and graduated from Pensbury. And, you know, I really was pretty happy with the schools all the way through. Okay. I thought they, they received a really good education. Oh, great. Do you have a favorite restaurant at all? Hmm. I guess it depends on what kind of food. My favorite restaurant changes every week. Okay. Locally, I guess just for, you know, something quick um, and, you know, not fancy, the Canal Street Grill in Yardley is one of my favorites. Okay. Which is salads, um, Greek food and um, great wings there. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, my wife and I love to explore all the, all the different restaurants. Uh, yeah, I've tried a few, as I said, on my biking trails in Lambertville. I wish I could remember some of the names, but they're all good up there. Mm -hmm. And they're all pretty um, and up in New Jersey, up that way. Um, locally, I guess, um, there's some good Italian restaurants in the right. um, Morrisville area. Mm -hmm. Georgie's. I don't think I've, I've never been there. In uh, right Bristol area, Township, yeah. Well, I'll yeah, have definitely. to try it. Some great pizza places. There's really something for everybody. It just depends oh. on what you want to do. Yeah, definitely. And uh, how would you finish up here? Uh, you know, your contact information. How can someone reach oh, you? Oh, sure. They, um, My office is in Ben Salem. Meet? My name's Holly Soffer, S-O-F-F-E-R. And the firm is Kellis and Soffer. Um, my phone number is 215-244-1044. Four, five. I don't know if you have that as a graphic or. Uh, no, we don't. But, but call Paul if you want to reach me because you can reach him. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, I always use Holly for uh, uh, our family uh, legal items and also, you know, if someone has the uh, real estate need also for an attorney, I always uh, have and I'll Holly. I'll just plug uh, Paul one me. more minute. You know, as an attorney, when coming into real estate transaction, when the person has a good realtor, it certainly makes my job a lot easier. And Paul has been doing real estate for so many years. He's really sharp and really does a great job. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alan. known him for a long time, I can say that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And he's honest as definitely. well, which isn't always the case. Yeah, so uh, appreciate your uh, coming Thanks, out, Holly. I really enjoyed us. it. You have to do part two because there's okay. a lot more of the agreement of it's, sale. It's a date. So uh, stay tuned for part two of this. <laughs> Next week, we have Mandy coming in from the uh, Bucks County Playhouse. Mandy's going to be talking about the, uh, the history of the Playhouse, uh, what's happened recently since they have under new ownership, some of the renovations, some of the programs that they're doing, some of the uh, education programs they have also. Um, and then, you know, hopefully she'll share with us some of the uh, things that, she, that the uh, Playhouse has uh, planned for the future uh, coming up also. So again, my name is Paul Rosso. Thank you for uh, joining us today. If you have any questions, you can reach me at 215-778-9687. Uh, you can follow our show on our website at buckscountyhomesandliving.com. You can follow us on Facebook at Good Life Bucks County. You can follow us on Twitter at Bucks County Live. So uh, have a great week, and we'll see you all next week.